sponsored today's event and like to welcome again all of you here to CSIS. The Philippines is an important U U.S. ally in the Pacific. Additionally, it makes a major contribution to the conduct of the global maritime industry, as you'll hear today. We are delighted to host a visiting delegation uh, to the United States from the Philippines, uh, both, uh, both elected officials and, uh, and uh, the private sector. Uh, also attending this afternoon is the Ambassador to the, for the Philippines. We welcome you, Ambassador Crescia. Thank you for joining us. Uh, but now it's my great pleasure to uh, uh, welcome and uh, allow to add his remarks the co-chairman of the U.S. Philippine Society, Ambassador John Negroponte. Mr. Ambassador. Thanks. You bet. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm pleased to introduce this discussion of global maritime affairs a topic of uh, fundamental importance to both Americans and Filipinos. Uh, work stoppages at major United States ports in February drew President Obama's personal attention as he dispatched both uh, Labor Secretary Perez and Commerce Secretary Pritzker to the West Coast. The dispute brought home the magnitude of our dependence on the flow of goods to and from this country across the Pacific, something many of us often take for granted. The Philippines, an archipelago of more than 7,000 islands, lies along the region's main shipping lanes, linking the South China Sea and points west through the Straits of Malacca to the producers and consumers of East Asia. The Philippines' burgeoning economy, growing at more than 6% annually, depends on uh, the shipping link to both internal and foreign markets. The country stands as the world's leading provider of maritime uh, professionals, and that is a, a data point that really impressed me. There's some, mm -hmm. at any given moment, there are some 400 thousand Filipino seamen at sea of a total population of one million Filipinos who are active duty uh, seamen at this particular point in time. And now ranks as the fourth largest shipbuilding country, another data point which really impressed me. Uh, its stake in the maritime industry is substantial and as we will hear shor shortly, evolving in new and exciting directions. Loc located on opposite sides of the Pacific, the United States and the Philippines were once separated by that vast ocean barrier. For centuries, principal waterways linking America to the world beyond its shores stretched across the Atlantic to Europe. The importance of our Pacific Coast ports emerged much later. More than a century before the North American colonial settlements, European navigators embarked on that great era of exploration. Ferdinand Magellan's attempt to circumnavigate the Earth stands as an economic milestone, although he was killed in battle with the Filipino leader Lapu Lapu near Cebu in, uh, in March 1521. I think there's a, <laughs> there's a monument marking that event, if I'm not mistaken, which I have personally visited. Uh, Magellan's expedition effectively laid the basis for the establishment of trans-Pacific trade from Manila to Acapulco, presaging globalization as we know it today. The galleon trade, this galleon trade, anchored in the Philippines, is sometimes called the world's first global trading system because it brought goods from China and the East to Latin America and on uh, to Europe and back uh, once or twice a year, beginning in 1565 uh, and lasting for 250 years. A truly impressive record for any international uh, trade regime. 
And actually, if you go to Puebla, the city of Puebla in Mexico, you'll see many of the vestiges of that trade in the artifacts, the, mm -hmm. uh, the ceramics. Uh, and particularly, I found it, if you look at the crucifixes, you'll see that quite a few of them have Asian characteristics for the, for the Christ figure. They, they were definitely made in the Philippines. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, uh, America's continental frontier finally closed, as historian Frederick Jackson Turner, Turner wrote in 1893. At about the same time, Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan's treatise, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, made a persuasive case for the benefits of a robust naval force and commercial shipping industry. As Americans increasingly looked outside the continental United States for new economic opportunities in the 1890s, tensions with Spain largely over Cuban independence exploded into conflict. And by then, the United States had established a Pacific presence. Americans came to the Philippines on May 1st, 1898, exactly uh, 117 years ago this week, when Admiral Dewey led his Asiatic squadron into Manila Bay to engage the Spanish fleet. The Pacific Ocean brought the first Filipinos to American shores in Hawaii, and California in the early 20th century. It was across the Pacific that Douglas MacArthur returned in 1944, fulfilling his promise to the Filipino people. And this year, we observed the 70th anniversary of the liberation of the Philippines and the end of the Pacific War. The Pacific has been central to both countries in the past, and our common maritime interests today are undiminished. The shipping industry is vital to sustained economic development and rising standards of living. We share concerns over preserving the vast richness of aquatic resources and for maintaining unimpeded access to the major nautical highways facilitating trade in and out of Asia. The U.S.-Philippine Strategic Alliance provides a, a ready backdrop for enhanced cooperation on maritime affairs. This week's visit by the Philippine Congressional Maritime Delegation is serving to strengthen that cooperation, especially in areas of concern to legislators, including synchronization of shipping operations, improved regulatory standards, and promotion of educational exchanges. The U.S. Philippine Society is delighted to partner with CSIS in raising awareness of the Philippines' role in maritime affairs, simulating more public discussion about global shipping in the 21st century, and exploring opportunities for old friends to reap new benefits in one of the world's most vital industries. And so for those reasons and many more, I personally look very much forward to this dialogue uh, that we're going to be uh, experiencing this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, we'd now like to begin the program with two presentations uh, that will, will help guide our discussion Thank as it goes along. Uh, first, let me welcome to the podium uh, the leader of the Philippine Congressional Delegation, uh, the Honorable Hazelito, or, or Jess Manalo. Congressman Manalo, please welcome. Good afternoon to the officers and staff of the Center for Strategic International Studies and to all our distinguished uh, guests gathered here today. A very pleasant uh, afternoon to all of you, including my colleagues from the House of Representatives, Congressman Sarmiento, Congresswoman Garcia, and Congressman Jonathan De La Cruz. In a sense, this is historic to all of us. We'd like to be here again in the United States because history would undeniably show that the Philippines and the United States have supported each other in diverse areas of mutual concerns. Today, we are very much thankful to the Center 
for hosting this uh, conference, your keen interest in the Philippines' con contribution to global maritime affairs truly inspires us to work harder and help promote the seafaring as a tool for the advancement not only of the industry, but also of the other ancillary businesses and services reliant on it. We also express our gratitude to the U.S. Philippine Society in helping organize this event. The establishment of the society is one of the many proofs of our long continuing friendship of these two nations. Truly, it is an honor for me to be here and would like to share our Maritime Party's Anklas endeavor as I, e as I am equally eager to learn from all the, your new ideas and proposed programs that can help initiate reforms for the industry I represent. Okay. No. When our party list Angla earned a seat in the House of Representatives in the Philippines in 2013, one of the most important responsibility we assume is to be the maritime voice in Congress. It was so important because very few know what the maritime industry was all about. It, it only speaks about seafarers boarding the sea, and yet they did not realize that 90% of world trade is run by the maritime industry. The 90% of world trade, which represents close to 18 trillion US dollars, is running the world trade. So that voice that was introduced in Congress was necessary to show our government, the policy makers, the significant role of this global maritime industry, principally, principally run by the shipping, by the ships, as well as the crew. Without the men and women of the maritime industry, vessels will not be able to sail, to sail and goods will not be transported from one country to another. The introvertible consequence of this scenario is one detrimental to the economy of the world because truly shipping moves 90% of world trade. In a book that I re recently read, 90% of everything, if shipping would stop today, half of the world will freeze and half, half of the world will go hungry. So this is how important the industry is. The significant contribution of our seafarers to the socio-economic development of the Philippines is a confirmation of the magnitude of the seafaring industry. The Central Bank of our country records show that the seafaring industry remittances have been increasing in 2014 alone. It amounted to close to 5.6 billion US dollars out of the 26 billion total overseas foreign workers that we have in our country. Clearly, these ever-increasing remittances comprise approximately 20% of the total remittances, notwithstanding the fact that our seafarers are only less than 5% of the total 10.5 million Filipino overseas workers all over the world. These remittances help boost the economic progress of several regions in our country. As we now serve to represent, to be the representative of the Philippine shipping sector, the big picture of the industry has been drawn and its details carved through the legislative measures that have been introduced in the House of Representatives. We have advocated for the concerns of the industry in giving it the attention and importance needed to navigate it towards a future that will promote its continued growth. We are unrelenting in our efforts to find better ways to protect our seafarers. We are persistent in promoting that our industry will always be included in the national agenda of the Philippine government. It has been our mission to champion the rights of the stakeholders of the Philippine maritime industry by principally making their concerns and needs part of the political, economic, and social consciousness of a country and its people. And we are confident to say that we have, in many occasions, already succeeded in making the executive and legislative departments come together to push programs geared towards navigating the maritime sector in its rightful place and significance in the national and global arena. I am truly proud 
to say that our Filipino seafarers occupy a premier position in the international fleets. Records show that in the past <coughs> 10 years, the demand for Filipinos to work on board foreign vessels has dramatically increased. Now the Filipinos comprise close to 30% of the market and there are even foreign vessels that are manned by an all Filipino crew. With the responsibility imposed on our Filipino seafarers to continuously advance world trade, we want to assure ship owners that we only deploy competent and efficient maritime professionals. Towards this end, our country have, has been successful in enacting a law, RA 10635, which was signed by our president in 2014, that ensures our seafarers are in compliance with internationally accepted standards of training, certification, and watchkeeping embodied in the STCW Convention. This becomes crucial given the need for more seafarers in the forthcoming and additional vessels constructed for shipping operations. The value of providing quality education to our seafarers cannot be negated. The insufficiency of resources, if not the lack of it, however, can sometimes adversely affect one's completion of his maritime education and training. It has long been my desire to have more training vessels in the Philippines that can help Filipino maritime students have actual onboard ship training, which is a prerequisite for them to graduate and obtain certification. And I'm optimistic that our visit in Washington our discussions with the authorities here are now opening doors for this possibility as to how the U.S. and the Philippines can work together to promote the enhancement of maritime education and training in the Philippines. We have also initiated efforts to implement a faster course that the youth may take to get employed on board vessels. Together with our Department of Education and the Maritime Industry Authority, we were at the forefront of implementing the pilot maritime high school program in three carefully selected maritime schools. This program provides high school graduates opportunity to get employed as ratings in either domestic or international fleets. Truth is, we desired to expose as many Filipinos, particularly the younger generation, to the seafaring industry and eventually let them see how the different yet related services can be a good source of their livelihood. We have drawn our attention to the other maritime related professionals such as shipbuilding and repair. Thus, we have a bill pushing for the modernization of the practice of naval architecture in our country. This, bills, this bill aims to give a new face to how our country should look into the necessity of shipbuilding as another potential source of employment in the midst of the ceaselessly advancing technology. This bill was already approved in the lower house on third reading. Part of the objectives too is the, orga is the organization of a comprehensive and orderly ship registry system for the regulation of vessels carrying the flag state. This bill intends to align our laws particularly to ship registry and enforcement of maritime claims on limitations of liability with existing international conventions and standards. This measure is a means to push us to further develop the field of shipping other than being only a premier human resource provider to international fleets all over the world. Equally important to us are laws that will enhance and modernize our domestic shipping. Briefly, we have three pending bills to address some of the pressing concerns of our local shipping industry. First is the extension of the tax exemption granted to our domestic vessels. Second is the extension of the tax exemption, or uh, rather, the second is the designation of a local classification society responsible to conduct technical inspection on our domestic vessels to ensure implementation of a uniformly stringent system of monitoring of domestic fleets, compliance with the safety and security standards, 
And in our meeting with the American Bureau of Standards, we were very pleased that they are very open to look into cooperating with our country to develop this one classification society. As we aspire to fortify and modernize our domestic vessels, we are pleased also to, as I mentioned, that the Bureau of Shipping, the American Bureau of Shipping, are open to provide the schemes that we could adopt and to introduce the changes that we seek. Further, we have filed a house measure geared towards the protection of seafarers who have monetary claims due to occupational hazards and illnesses against abuse of ambulance chasers taking advantage of the unfortunate circumstance of the seafarers. The bill in our country is referred as the Anti-Ambulance Chasing Act. And it passed Congress on third reading and is now pending with the Senate for approval. In the filing and co the, in the filing and co-author of the bills, both maritime related to national importance, we all we continuously take an active role in painstakingly deliberations of bills prior to their final approval, especially those focusing on maritime safety, seafarers' rights, and maritime labor issues such as insurance and repatriation. This is so important that we have this voice in Congress, and this is the kind of discussion that we brought to the United States, that truly the maritime, a strong force in the Philippine society and in government, should also be considered by our friends and allies here in the United States. From this forum, we anticipate to hear a lot more inputs and strategic insights from the world's top experts in global challenges, regional security, trans transnational issues, including, of course, maritime security and affairs. For half a century, the center, CSIS, has been continuously committed to sharing its knowledge, expertise, and in-depth research towards global development, which undeniably is best achieved through the help of shipping. Surely the forthcoming discussions will provide innovative ideas that can help us fulfill our objectives of introducing new policies and creating the transformation that the Philippine maritime industry needs. These reforms in turn will hopefully further fortify universal trading and expand our investment ties. I just want to close that our Filipino seafarers is part of the group that moves the world. And we're proud to say that these endeavors of our country should also be shared and we need help from allies and friends from the society here in the United States and our colleagues and our counterparts in the US Congress. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about our industry in the Philippines. Thank you, Congressman. We're delighted your delegation is here in Washington. Uh, the, uh, the private sector of the Philippines uh, maritime industry is also uh, part of this delegation. And we next welcome to the podium Gerardo Borromeo, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Philippine Transportation Carriers. Gerardo. Thank you very much, Scott. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Quisha, Ambassador Negroponte. Um, in my remarks this afternoon, I think you might think that uh, the congressman and I are always talking. In fact, we are because we need to collaborate. So many of the data points that we talk about and the references that we have are quite similar. And I think that reflects the uh, alliance that we're trying to create and the alliance that we're trying to bring forward. But let me add as well my welcome to this forum, highlighting the Philippines' efforts towards an expanded role in global maritime affairs and how this can promote greater opportunities between the U.S. and the Philippines. A warm round of thanks to CSIS. Let me see if I get that. Sorry. There we go. There we go. A warm round of thanks to CSIS for putting this program together in cooperation with the U.S. Philippine Society and, of course, the Chamber of Shipping of America. It isn't every day that one has an opportunity to exchange views with such a distinguished audience, and so we're very privileged to be here with you this afternoon. At our company, PTC, we believe in this idea that the Philippines and Filipino global maritime professionals move the world. 
Now, you might ask, how is that possible? How is that so? Congressman Manalo referred to a book, 90% of everything. Inside shipping, which is considered an invisible industry, puts clothes on your back, gas in your car, and food on your plate by the lady Rose George, an author. It provides an inside view of the strategic importance of the maritime industry, given that over 90% of world trade is moved by ships. In effect, shipping serves as the heart of trade and economic development and continues to be an enabler for globalization and sustainable growth. <coughs> Underscoring this statement are a couple of key points. The value of materials and products shipped in 2014 topped $18.95 trillion. Over the next 15 years, it is anticipated that total trade volumes will double from 10 billion tons to 20 billion tons by 2030. Currently, there are around 80,000 vessels that make up the uh, international merchant fleet, manned by some 1,000 or 1, 400,000 maritime professionals from all over the world. And of this number, the Philippines contributes close to 30%, or just under 400,000 people on board these vessels at any one time. We are today the single largest source for maritime talent globally, and as such, the Philippines is a partner of equal interest to both ship owners and ship owners and ship managers all over the world. Over the last 20 years, however, there has been an ever-increasing regulatory fervor requiring more and more quality built into ships, shipping and logistics processes, requiring more quality and backstop by higher competency at the helm. Stepping up to this challenge, the Philippines is addressing the critical importance of education and training to the sustained development of globally qualified and competent talent ensuring that the Philippines, Filipinos, will continue to move the world. We have here this afternoon, as was described by Congressman Manalo, the author of recent important changes to our maritime legislative agenda. That is Congressman Manalo, head of the Maritime Party. He, together with Congressman Sarmiento, Congressman Garcia, and Congressman De La Cruz, together with our Maritime Industry Authority, serve as the new face of Maritime Philippines. When you provide close to 30% of the total number of seafarers on board the world's cargo vessels, this translates into a significant contribution to the Filipino economy, and it has done so. In 2014 alone, as was mentioned, the seafaring sector remitted over $5.6 billion into our economy, representing 20% of the remittances received that year, a figure that has consistently been growing at some 5% year on year. While the Philippines is the leading resource base of maritime professionals, the world's leading flag registry is Panama, accounting for over 20% of total tonnage globally. Now, interestingly enough, Filipinos make up over 65% of the maritime professionals on board Panamanian flag vessels. So this begs the question, what prevents the Philippines from becoming a leading registry for ships? Or for that matter, what prevents the Philippines from emerging as a leading center for maritime services across the board? Today, the Philippines is the fourth largest shipbuilding country in the world, albeit the far fourth to China, Korea, and Japan. But with the anticipated doubling of world trade, clearly the demand for vessels will continue. Given our current standing relative to shipbuilding and our leadership in maritime human resource development, a significant case can and should be made for the Philippines to continue to move up that value chain of maritime service providers. For a country with a population that exceeds 100 million today, anticipated to reach 150 million by 2050, the Philippines is compelled to, to sustain its recent economic gains. Inclusive growth as a key element to overall economic planning is very much needed to achieve the country's development goals. The maritime industry represents an important cluster of economic activities that can help address the drive for employment growth, income generation, and the follow-through multiplier effect of expanded spending among those positively impacted. With Asia front and center on the agendas of the world's leading economies, and with ASEAN implementing its long-planned integration into a dynamic regional growth market, it is critical for the Philippines to keep in step with the rest of the world. A determined strategy, therefore, to engage in the global maritime arena provides the Philippines a means to do so particularly with its more developed Asian neighbors, Japan, 
Korea, and China, who are all giants in the maritime arena. It would also allow the country to collaborate more closely with the U.S. on maritime issues central to free trade and regional stability, particularly with recent events surrounding what we call the West Philippine Sea. Cooperative activities between the Philippine maritime sector and counterparts in the U.S. can range from maritime education and training, to shipbuilding and repair, and even defense-related industries, to lead the development of a more robust engagement leveraging on our country's long shared history and mutual interest in global maritime activities. Today, Maritime Philippines is facing interesting circumstances. With our country's focus on the shipping industry, the time for us to act is now. In the days of sail, these situations were called oportu, the Latin phrase from which the word opportunity, the English word opportunity, is derived. It describes the mix of tide and wind that allow the vessels to come to port. For us in the Philippines today, maritime Philippines, the tide is rising. At the same time, opportunities abound for maritime USA, and they're very much present. So if we look at this together, the work we have before us will allow that momentum of the tide to bring us forward. And it is within, with this in, in, in mind that we are here with you to share our views, and we look forward to a discussion in a short while, and also to some words of, a, of advice from Joe Cox. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're now joined by, uh, by our third panelist, Joseph Cox, Chief Executive Officer Thank of the you. Chamber of Shipping of America. You guys put me in the middle here. <laughs> well, Joe, we'll split up the delegation here momentarily. Uh, but let me start our panel discussion by asking Joe for his perspective and observations uh, based on what you've heard so far. Well, thank you, Scott, and uh, ambassadors, uh, welcome here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure that some of you, uh, my friends sitting out there are saying, uh, why is Joe Cox sitting up there? And I can only say that the, they would share the question with my four immigrant grandparents who would say, how did you get there? <laughs> and uh, I would answer them by saying, good genetics. <laughs> right. But as to why I'm here, I think we can go back to the, uh, the, the uh, the, the, the phrase, well, it's been used by all three of these previous speakers, including uh, uh, Ambassador Negroponte, and that is the 400,000 seafarers that are Filipinos that are on our vessels. And when I say our vessels, the Chamber of Shipping of America represents American companies that own, operate, and charter ships. We are very active and robust uh, uh, defenders of our Jones Act. We are also very active and robust defenders of the American presence in the international industry. And indeed, this is an international industry. And I, I just wrote a few notes about the 400,000 seafarers. I think that's slightly misleading, uh, gentlemen, because the number of officers represented in the Filipino uh, maritime uh, engagement is, is not that large. The majority of the 400,000 are, uh, are ratings, if I can use that as a generality. And if you say that, then suddenly this, this 400,000 becomes even more important because if there are 80,000 vessels, and I'm just guessing at numbers, mm -hmm. let's say 20,000 are just uh, so close to various shores that they have their, their seafarers on board. So you have 60,000 vessels out there. Given the crew sizes, I think that we could look at about half of the world's ships are being manned by Filipino seafarers. And I think that's an even more telling statistic. Uh, now, why am I here? I think many years ago I met uh, Dio, well, not that many years ago, but uh, his <laughs> your predecessor, Carlos Salinas, uh, who is now, um, is he still the ambassador yeah, to Spain? Ambassador to Spain. Yeah, Spain. Carlos, uh, I met him uh, probably 35 years ago. We were at the International Labor Organization in uh, Geneva and we were debating various conventions which dealt with seafarers' uh, work and uh, their, their rights at work and their protections. And after a period of time, we, the ship owners, saw the opportunity to say, we are really wasting our time here dealing with international singular standards. So we said, why don't we have an overarching uh, umbrella convention that deals with seafarers' working conditions, living conditions, and their basic rights. 
And we, the ship owners, presented that to the international labor community, mm -hmm. uh, and represented then by the International Transport Workers Federation. And we said, let's have a uniform, all-encompassing convention. And it took us, I think, eight years. Mm -hmm. But we combined 65 conventions in the world into a single enforceable maritime labor convention. And I am quite proud in my professional career to have played one of the major speaking roles and leading roles within the war for the development of that convention. And so the reason I am here is to further the uh, Filipino aspirations to become a more active participant in our maritime world. And uh, I think anything that I can do to, uh, to assist the, the workforce of the world that is operating on ships, and I, I confess I used to go to sea myself, and I know how it is to be treated like, by, like a seafarer by certain individuals, particularly those who want to give you shore leave right. or not give you shore leave. <laughs> and so I have a very sensitive spot relative to the seafarers of the world. And mm -hmm. anything we can do to raise the level of all seafarers is certainly something acceptable. Uh, and I'm going to talk to the, uh, the chairman later about his uh, uh, ambulance chasing uh, legislation. I, I don't know whether I would even want to suggest that in the United States, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we will consider the word. But anyway, I'll turn it over to you. Scott. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. Uh, what I'd like to do is start a discussion here uh, uh, by, by asking uh, Congressman Manolo, Manolo and Gerardo uh, to comment a little bit, if you would please, on your conversations with U.S. officials. You're, you're here, you're making what I think is a very compelling case for a partnership uh, between the United States and the Philippines. And I, I think our audience would be interested to hear, what, what kinds of things have you heard? What have you learned? Are there a couple of key reactions uh, to your meetings this week that you'd like to share with the audience? Basically, our discussion with our, uh, first with the uh, executive branch of the United States from the Department of Transportation, I consider them very positive uh, developments when they consider that we could study the possibility of an exchange program for our seafarers, mm -hmm. uh, for our students most specifically, that yeah. they can come over and study and revive the strong exchange programs to uplift standards of education and training. And they always mention to us that they will look at it and they, they're very open. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when it comes to the standards of uh, classification of vessels, they said that they're willing to look into it and they'll ask their counterpart, their, the lawmakers also, if there, if there are no restrictions. Mm -hmm. But for, from the lawmakers, from the uh, people in Congress, we got a very much positive view because we've talked to Congressman um, Salmon and he mm -hmm. said he, loved, he would love to go to the Philippines. Yeah, great. And uh, uh, three of them said, yes, send the invitation because truly uh, we have probably not seen the value of ship repair and ship building, the potential in our country. Yes. So those are things very positive to us. And uh, for a few days of discussion and for a few minutes of uh, meetings with them, this I would consider to be quite substantial already. That's great. Gerardo, any yeah. reactions? No, I, I'll, I'll, echo, I'll echo what Congressman Manalo said. I think as far as the U.S. Maritime Administration is concerned, there is a recognition of the fact that the U.S. is a maritime nation yeah. and that they do need to reach out to the rest of the world. And so the opportunity to exchange views and to establish cooperative programs with the Philippines is something definitely of interest. But when we were on Capitol Hill today, uh, what we saw uh, going through the halls of Congress was democracy in action. And you would see all of the little conferences going on. And it amazes me how um, all of the uh, leaders uh, within Cap the Capitol Hill can actually focus on, on, on all of those ranges of topics. But when we uh, stopped and talked about the Philippines and our interests, they focused in and they recognized that, yes, there is a need to actually build these bridges just okay. because uh, world trade really depends on the maritime uh, activity. So what we need to do is follow up with uh, these initial discussions and between the public sector and the private sector holding hands, uh, working with our counterparts in the U.S. with the Chamber sure. of Shipping of America, be able to establish focal points, whether it's in maritime education and training, whether it is in terms of cooperative shipbuilding activities or other maritime related services, this is the opportunity for us to carry forward. Mm -hmm. You know, given the scale of, uh, of uh, Filipinos in, as professional staff 
of the shipping industry worldwide. Uh, I when I when you share, first shared those those figures with me, I was stunned by the by the sheer number of, of Filipinos uh, working as professional mariners. Uh, and uh, I thought to my travels through airports, I was at one time in my life a relatively frequent air traveler, and I always noticed when I was standing in the immigration line, even, even the, the immigration line returning to uh, Dulles Airport, uh, that there was a line over there uh, for, uh, for the air crews. Uh, the pilots and the flight attendants that seemed to move a lot faster than the line I was in, <laughs> almost regardless of what circumstance. What, can you characterize uh, whether that, that kind of, uh, of, of treatment by a receiving nation when a ship makes port of call uh, is the same for the professional uh, maritime crews as it is for pilots? Or what, what are your expectations in regard to the treatment of your nationals abroad? Well, basically, we want to... Uh um, change the mindset of uh, uh, the immigration people and uh, probably some countries <clears throat> that the seafarers or the, uh, the people that run the vessels are yeah. equally important just like the air crew. I, I would always say the ship would cost close to 100 million US dollars. Right. The cargo would probably uh, carry about 20 million or 30 million. Yeah. And these crew are as important as the rest. They're global right. maritime professionals. In our country, we used to think that probably the seafarer may not possess the mind of an engineer or a lawyer, but right now the sophistication or the build of the vessel mm -hmm. is so uh, upgraded <laughs> that you need very intelligent people, and right. these are the people that man. So. I would, I'm pushing, I'm starting with our country, that in our country I'm setting up the seafarers' lounge. I want our seafarers that they live, they will experience a business class lounge. And our country has agreed that they will give our seafarers that opportunity, that opportunity of being treated well. And in other countries, maybe a policy that can be open where they can be given a card of an immediate access, just like the crew of the aircraft, of mm -hmm. the airplane. So I think we're going there. The recognition, as one Joe, as Joe mentioned, the ILO is already recognizing. We have the ILO mm -hmm. 185 that recognizes the standard card of all the seafarers. And once that's in place, you can have that card and you can go to any country in the world sure. and you can work anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it will be recognized because that's readable. Mm -hmm. So things are developing. And I, I believe that they will reach that level of equal importance to the rest of uh, uh, I would say transportation yes. uh, personnel, including mm -hmm. comparable to the pilots and the rest of uh, mm -hmm. the industry. Great, thank you. Well, let me now turn to our audience. Uh, you've been very patient, and, and uh, I hope that you, like I did, learned a lot about uh, the Philippine maritime industry. I'd like to open to questions. Uh, basically, three rules for questions here. First, Please wait for the microphone because uh, this is being uh, live webcast and recorded, and uh, no one will hear your question if you don't have the microphone. Uh, second, when you get the microphone, please identify yourself and the organization you represent. And third, please uh, make sure your question, as Alex Trebek would say, in, is in the form of a question. Uh, thank you. With that, uh, look for uh, anyone from the audience with a question. Yes, sir. Hi there, my name, my name is John Gallagher. I'm with uh, IHS Maritime and Trade here in Washington. I wanted to know if you could, one of you, explain um, where Philippines stands within the Trans-Pacific Trans uh, Partnership and what potential opportunities there are on the, uh, for maritime trade through that partnership with the Philippines, or, or that trade agreement with the Philippines. Was that the Trans-Pacific? Yeah, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So, uh, I mean, I can make the comment that uh, that right now the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a 12-party agreement. All the members of the of or all the negotiating parties are members of APEC, as is the Philippines. In fact, the Philippines is the host of APEC this year. Uh, and but I, ca I can't speak for the Philippine government. I believe there have been expressions of interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but I can't go beyond that. Mr. Ambassador, do you care to comment or? I don't mean to draw you into this, but... Yeah, well, as you said, the Philippines has uh, indicated an expression of interest to join the TPP, but we 
also recognize that we have challenges, and, and one of these major challenges is the fact that there are still restrictions in terms of foreign ownership in certain sectors of the economy, which would require uh, an amendment uh, in the Constitution. Yes. Congress is addressing that, and I think Congressman Manalo could talk about that. The Speaker of the House introduced a, a bill that would allow uh, Congress to set the legislation instead of it being in the Constitution. But that's going to take time. Uh, I, don't, I can't tell how long. But uh, we are already undertaking um, informal, uh, I wouldn't say negotiate, but informal discussions with various uh, countries uh, among the 12 mm -hmm. that will be the original members of TPP. And we're hopeful that we could accede uh, in the next uh, round. Uh, when that will be, we don't know, but, but we are preparing for that. Thank you. Maybe, Scott, maybe I could add sure. some a perspective from the private sector standpoint. I think that when you talk about global trade, inevitably it's important for the Philippines to be participant in that. As to the rules of the game, I believe that continues to evolve and we will participate in the best manner that the government feels uh, that is proper. Uh, however, when you look at it from the perspective of shipping, shipping will only follow trade. We can only do so much, and you've got to be able to create the ground rules for right. which trade will fa fa facilitate itself. Uh, what we would like to be able to do in, in the context of the maritime cluster within the Philippines is evolve from not only providing people, but being a place where uh, shipbuilding, ship repair, and all sorts of allied services that can use the Philippines as a platform for the rest of the world can, can take place. Mm -hmm. So uh, while we would like to participate in uh, trade arrangements like TPP, um, we will wait for the proper uh, time for that to happen. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, though, we are already looking at what we can do within the shipping industry, which serves as a backbone for trade, to ensure that at, at some point or in some manner we will participate, whether it's through our uh, maritime professionals, it's through services that to support the shipping industry. So we will be there in one form or fashion, and we mm -hmm. hope that at the appropriate time we will participate in the broader uh, alliances that are, are being generated. Thank you. Congressman, did you have a point of view? Or? Well, to follow up the point raised by our ambassador, uh, Ambassador Quisha, uh, indeed Congress has already uh, 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 initiated the measure to lift the uh, restrictive provisions in our Constitution. And it's not, uh, it is uh, amending the portion of the economic provisions that would allow ownership of certain industries by foreign nationals. So that is uh, already moving and uh, it has the support of our speaker and the Senate president and I do hope that this w bill uh, would eventually pass into a law before the 16th Congress uh, ends. That's good news, thank you. Yes, there's a question in the middle here, yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, I'm Mitzi Picard and it's good to see Gerardo Borromeo after our high school days. Uh, Dito or Gerardo, you mentioned about the West Philippine Sea. I'm, I'm with the U.S. Filipinos for Good Governance and I was with Asia Society for a long time. Um, my question is, um, how is the Philippine maritime industry dealing with the West Philippine issues? And then my second short question is, um, how are you dealing with the illegal recruiters, especially with the incident of Mary Jane Veloso? Is that rampant also amongst the seafarers, the illegal recruiters? Thank you. Shall we take on the next question? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, let's put it this way. I think that when you talk about the West Philippine Sea, that is more a political issue, and it is an issue properly put with our government. As far as the private sector is concerned, we look for access to uh, a, a trade uh, navigation routes. So it'll be in our interest, and not only our interest, but the interest of the rest of the world, to have free navigation because free trade requires that we are able to move from point to point. And shipping doesn't really see any boundaries. We can't see boundaries. We are there as a logistics backbone for world trade, and we need access in order to be able to bring goods from point A to point B. That's the only way we're going to be able to move the world. So we wait for, for the governments of this world to be able to provide the necessary access, and we will follow through. With, when you talk about illegal recruiting, I think that's always an issue. But as Joe Cox had mentioned, that within the framework of the International Labor Organization, there are very well-established governance policies that look after seafarers' rights. 
In fact, the Magna Carta of seafarers, which is the Maritime Labor Convention of 2006, which is considered the fourth pillar of governance within the maritime industry, is very, very clear. And it actually sets seafarers or maritime professionals apart from those that are recruited for land-based activities. So you actually can set these two people apart, or these two types of professional workers. We're very well governed. Uh, the seafarers are very well protected. And in fact, I'd, I'd like to pass on that, the rest of that question, if I may, to Joe. Because you can, no, you can, talk about, you can talk about how well protected seafarers are. And because of that whole governance structure and the fact that we have an, uh, an employment administration within the Philippines, we're far ahead of most other countries in terms of protecting the interests of, of maritime professionals. Joe? Yeah, to carry it on, I was the spokesman for the ship owners in the Social Security area, which is where wages and that came into the discussion. And, and certainly illegal recruiting is something that's not, not just, uh, it's endemic. It's not something centered just in the Philippines. It's, it's around the world. And there's an aspect of the Maritime Labor Convention which uh, puts responsibilities on the labor supplying countries. Mm -hmm. So they have to take certain steps and, and, and satisfy themselves that they are doing the right thing with respect to their seafarers. Concurrent with that obligation of the labor supplying country is the country who is hiring those seafarers has to ensure that their ship owner is ensuring that the labor supplying country is meeting its obligations. So there's a, a concurrent obligation on the, ship, the shipping company or the flag of the shipping company to say we are checking up and making sure. And so we, we, we took a long time to make sure that there was that connection between those supplying and those who are hiring to make sure that there was no, is it, is it going to be perfect? I, I assure you, as I sit here, there are people who have thought processes that, that could get around it, right? But we, we did the best we could at the mm -hmm. time. And if there are, if there are I think, things that pop up down the road, there's, there's an amendment process to the MLC. And I, I'm sure you, we will, we meet yearly as a special tripartite committee to take a look at the, the abuses that could start to arise. So we haven't just take, we think take care of the problem, we think we've set up a process whereby in the future we can continue to address problems as they arise. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let me take that point sure, from, sure. from Jeff. Uh, the protection of the seafarers in our country is um, well covered by the ILO. That's why I was constrained to file the anti-ambulance chasing law, simply because of the protection given the seafarers. In the normal disability cases, if you're covered by the CBA or uh, the International Convention, uh, this disability uh, uh, amount is tremendous. And what uh, some people are doing is they take advantage of this uh, uh, provision that allows the payment of disability to the seafarers, and they, they do the ambulance chasing. Mm -hmm. And it is immoral, uh, to my mind, the, the moral uh, concern of getting only 20 or 30 percent of that amount that would go to the person who was injured and let the, these ambulance chasers get, chasers get more. Uh, that's why I was prompted to file the bill and I would make this ambulance chasing uh, principle criminal in nature and it has passed the third reading in our house and it's now supported in the Senate because we want the injury, the person who was injured, to get the full compensation because that's, the, that's what the insurance is all about. So that is the kind of protection that we want to put to our seafarers. And I think the, the, uh, the House and the, the lower house and the Senate has seen that this is an industry that should be protected and to be paid, those who were injured should be paid and not those people who are trying to take advantage. So I, I'd like to take that up because okay. I'm very passionate when it comes to the protection of rights to our seafarers. And, and Chairman, you. if I can add to that, to put a sort of a monetary thing, once a seafarer is injured on board a ship, the, uh, the, the ship owner has a responsibility to, to put him back to where he was before he got injured. And so in, in, in the U.S. we call it maintenance and cure. Part of that maintenance and cure is his full pay. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not a small matter. Yes. We're talking about the person's full pay and somebody coming by and saying, I will, I will take 20 or 30 percent of that. So I, I, I congratulate you on, on the fact that you're creating a, a legal remedy right. within your law that isn't going to have to take somebody taking that amount of money from the seafarer in order to accomplish what is supposed to happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Ambassador Maestro. Yes. Question in front, and then we'll get in the back. Right. 
Uh, thank you. This is a bit of a political question for both Please. sides. Could you introduce here. yourself first? Yeah, my name is John Maestro. I'm president of the U.S. Philippine Society. That's our logo up there to the lower right. Hand side. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you had to choose one or two of the things that you would like to see our respective governments do in order to advance this particular agenda. On the Philippine side, what would you recommend? And on the American side, what would you recommend? And I don't see any problem with each side telling the other what it should be doing. I'm talking about executive branch decisions or congressional uh, actions that are going to advance opportunities for cooperation in the maritime area. Mm -hmm. I, can I take the lead sure. on that? Sure. I think the, um, the essence of shipping has to be sustainability and safety. The sustainability and safety of shipping is dependent on the individuals that we put on board. And the individual must be trained to the highest standards, to global standards. And so if there is an opportunity for the US and the Philippines to cooperate, it has to start with maritime education and training and establish the basis of training and, and development from the highest standards, the global standards. Because if we have that, we can then regenerate the resource on a continuing basis in order for shipping to be a sustainable industry. So I would start just on the basic of the fact that we have to have a core um, uh, curriculum, the faculty that can be trained, and therefore provide students that are, are necessary. And we talked about the fact that we could create exchange programs, because on a ship you don't necessarily have one nationality. You can have multiple nationalities. So multi it's a multicultural environment, sure. so being able to understand different cultures working within an enclosed environment for a prolonged period of time is very, very important for the sustainability of teamwork. And so the more we can expose both American uh, um, uh, cadets and Filipino cadets in training exercises, then I think the better it is for, for both our countries and for any other country for that matter. So at least that's one point that I think uh, we would like to stress. Mm -hmm. Joe? Uh, yes, I think when Dito and I were talking, and we've spent many an hour over at the, in Geneva and in London talking about various things, but the, the, the fact that what could we offer uh, a question comes to my mind, I'm not going to ask the question, but that is with 400,000 seafarers, what percent are officers? And, and then a, a, an ancillary question that I think we have to ask is, how many aspire to be an officer? Mm -hmm. And so how do we create a, 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 a process in your country where you can, you can take advantage of those aspirations of, of truly talented young men and women mm -hmm. To, to rise in the ranks. How do we do that? And uh, tomorrow we're going to be visiting uh, the Seafarers International Union training facility in, in Piney Point, Maryland. And I think they do an exceptional job at training ratings. Mm -hmm. But they also have an aspect of their training where they say, we recognize that some of you are going to go forward. And so they give them a, like a, 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 an initiation into that structural teaching that would be necessary to become an officer. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, I'm going to enjoy the reactions tomorrow to, to seeing their facility. And that's timely because I think the pet project of Congressman Manalo is the Maritime High School. Well, let me put it this way, Joe. We have 91 schools in our country, maritime schools. And out of the 91 schools, only 8% become officers. So I went to the data. I went to the statistics. Why is this so? Mm -hmm. And it boils down to a very simple thing. These 91 schools, because of the law that was passed that I principally authored, we were able to reduce the schools to about 23. Because these 23 schools are the schools that have the training facilities and the training vessels that allows cadetship program. So the, 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 what is needed, as what Joe is saying, how do we move our ratings to become officers, mm -hmm. is the eventual production of students who will go through the process of a cadetship. Right. It's a training vessel that's so crucial to us. Yes. You need that in order to comply with STCW, that you need one year of cadetship program before you can take the exam and before you can become an officer. So we have identified the solution. Yes, we're producing a lot of ratings, but we need to find the balance, the balance of producing the ratings and the officers. Mm -hmm. If we produce enough officers and ratings, then that would eventually meet the, the supply and demand of international demands. But what we're saying is without the officers, 
the Philippines will remain in that level, and that's what we're working, that eventually our ship, uh, the graduates, should move towards becoming an officer. And we have developed two programs now because of this law. There's what you call the enhanced level course. In other words, if you want to be a rating, just study for two years. Right. If you want to be a, sh a ship officer, study for four years and one year of cadetship program. So now you have the choice. So yeah. if we create another law that will move towards the ladderized education, that the seafarers of this rating can mm -hmm. eventually move up to become officers, that would give an opportunity for our country right. who are actually underemployed or needs the employment to work for two or three years as rating and eventually move up, ladderize, and become officers. Mm -hmm. And I think that would produce the kind of good officer that we need because they're exposed to the sea. It's just like a soldier. Sure. You graduate from the best school, but you don't have combat experience. You will lack something. Right. So I think this program that we're doing, the Maritime High School, the enhanced level course, because of the law that was passed in our country, we can assure our friends, our colleagues in the shipping industry that we're going to produce good people. That would achieve some of Gerardo's goal yes. of uh, sustainability. At, at the first level. Yes. Uh, beyond that, then there's a the ship. Yeah. What can we do with the ship in terms of managing the ship? There are mm -hmm. all sorts of ancillary services where we can manage the ship, whether it's on board the technical management or support services that uh, go around um, uh, the right. ship. And so again, the Philippines can serve as a platform because we can be the back office for many yes. of the services that are used to support shipping operations. And again, that is an area of cooperation between our two countries. But when you talk about the ship itself, we can do a lot in terms of the repair of the ship, and even the ship, the building of a ship. I mean, I mentioned the fact that uh, we are the fourth largest shipbuilding country today, although a far fourth uh, yeah. to Japan, which is in third place. But with an interest, say, for example, to reutilize the lower cost platform of the Philippines, we can build ships. We can also repair ships. So ships that are trading in the Asian region, and you will see more and more of that happen as the, the, the nucleus or the nexus of trade comes to Asia, then we become a central point a, a, a hub for, for this type of activities. And again, there are industries within the U.S. where they can collaborate with Filipino partners to be able to create that, that sort of platform within the Philippines. So there are various stages between looking at the ship, looking at the people who run the ship, and even the handling of cargo where the Philippines and the U.S. can cooperate uh, on various fronts. And I think this is the kind of maritime cluster that we're trying to create mm -hmm. and an opportunity for, to discuss the rules of engagement uh, when you talk of global maritime affairs. Sure. Thank you. Um, there's been a lady in the back who's been very patient, yes, in the green suit. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Beth Wong with the Governor's Commission on Asian Pacific and another organization, the Alpha Phi Omega District of Columbia. My question to the panel, one is that Congressman Manala, I'm glad you're there because um, I have a brother who's a graduate of the PMMA, Philippine Merchant Marine Academy. And so my family, I live in Subic. There are two shipyards there. And so I am in this industry. My question to you, you mentioned about benefits, monetary claim. Is there a set aside funds by the government for those seafarers who became a hostage related to piracy? Well, with regard to the piracy issue, the piracy is not a local issue alone. It's an international issue that um, I believe uh, uh, we're trying to solve it. And the, Philipp the only um, uh, fund available for the Philipp from the Philippines is providing uh, what you call the repatriation. Because the rule on piracy is that we pay no ransom. So if they're uh, really uh, um, in that situation, no government will eventually pay the ransom to, to these people. And uh, we use diplomacy, we use the um, uh, functions of uh, government to diplomatic post to really uh, find out what can be done. But uh, the rule is we make no payment. And I think that government policy stands even today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, question here, and we'll uh, Scott. I think. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. I, I was I was hoping he'd go on too, but the uh, no, the uh, Maritime Labor Convention does have requirements about paying seafarers, and while it's a slightly gray area, 
Uh, it's, it's my personal opinion and one that I would articulate in Geneva if the question came up. The fact that a ship has been pirated, the seafarers are still on board, the ship is still actively in operation, mm -hmm. although it's being withheld from doing what it wants to do. So uh, in, my, in my experience, most ship owners have continued paying the seafarers until such time as there's a resolution of the piracy. And, and, and most governments will not pay ransom because uh, it only encourages more mm -hmm. piracy. And I understand that argument. But at the same time, to, to, to say to the seafarer, well, you're not getting paid anymore because you've been pirated, is something the industry does not accept. So the continuing payment of the seafarers and allotments going home sure. to their, their families, it, it, in my experience, has continued. Now, there may be, play, there may be ships where that did not happen. And, and there, is a, or there are a couple of cases where, uh, I'm sorry, but a, a disreputable owner walked away and ignored the vessel. And, and that's unfortunate. But at the same time, the MLC does have uh, Provision. provisions that would, uh, would handle that, and it's up to the flag state then to take over the responsibility. Yes, we have, uh, have a question here and a question in the middle of the back there and one here. So let's take, uh, let's take these three, and uh, we're running out of time. I'm sorry about that, but we'll, try to take, okay. we'll take the questions and then go to the answers. So. Yeah, thank you. My name is Eddie Lechica. I'm a retired journalist. I was wondering whether the, whether the maritime delegation could uh, bring its excellent ideas in the context of the ASEAN economic community. The, this raises a tricky question whether the Philippines can regard Indonesia, which is the largest archipelago, also the source, the second source, second largest source of sea favors in the world, whether you can regard Indonesia as a partner or as a competitor. Okay. Uh, you know, one idea that came out, I, I think, from the Arroyo administration, for instance, was to link the uh, construction of RO, RO container ports with the similar building that Indonesia is doing. In other words, to work together collaboratively instead of as competition, like for instance, do we all build uh, Panamax uh, container ships okay. and create a glut in the world, or do we specialize, for instance? Okay, hold, on to, hold on to that question. Let's get two more here. And uh, there's a question here and one over here, yes. Rapid fire questions. Hey, answer. Dave Halliday with the Spectrum Group. Uh, my question is about shipbuilding and ship repair. Uh, I had a recent conversation, I believe it's true, that uh, our expertise in shipbuilding and ship repair is kind of retiring internationally. And um, while we are still building ships, we are not advancing in technology like we are in the cruise industry and in the yacht and making. Sir, who is we? Um, I'm talking internationally. Okay. I'm talking, you know, the world industry. The world as a whole. Okay. So my question is, how are you going to face this challenge of recruiting shipbuilding, ship repair personnel mm -hmm. to work those shipyards and build the ships needed for the numbers that we're talking about in the future, which okay. are astounding. Sure, okay. Third question was up here. Yes, sir. Uh, my question has to do with... Oh, could you introduce yourself first? Wait for the microphone, then. Thank you. Uh, Henry Howard, uh, U.S. Philippine Society. Uh, my question... Oh, and by the way, uh, Philippine Consul in Florida, I forgot. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> thanks to... Uh, Great. <laughs> um, my question has to do with the effect on the shipbuilding industry in the Philippines in light of the new parallel Panama Canal locks, mm -hmm. which will uh, scale up the uh, ships beyond what we all know as Panamax-sized ships. Mm -hmm. Can you scale up the shipbuilding facilities to to accommodate the construction of these larger post Panamax ships. Okay, so great. We take yeah, let's, so that's the lightning round. Right. We, we have uh, we have uh, uh, Indonesia yes. uh, Philippines cooperation. Right. We have uh, the Panama Canal effects on shipbuilding and, ship, and ship general, general shipbuilding technology change. So let take me, them in any let, me let me take the first one. I think that uh, the mention of Indonesia is good. Uh, my personal belief is competition is good. Competition will bring out the best in what we're able to do. But let's take that in the context of the fact that 
world economy will, will continue to evolve. There will be more ships, and therefore, demand for those ships, we will need more qualified people. Now, because we are all moving towards a higher global standard, then it will be the market that will decide who among the people, who among the countries will be able to provide that. And I'm very confident with uh, the support of the government, with the continuing interest of various ship owners in the Philippines, that we will be able to continue to produce the kind of seafarers, maritime professionals, not only as ratings, but really as officers. And so I'm very, very confident that we will continue to be a leader in providing these, notwithstanding the fact that there are other countries out there that would also like to promote uh, their people. Like I said, for us in the private sector, competition is good, competition is, is essential, and it'll just bring the best uh, of us. Turning to, um, let me take this one in the context of the, the third. In terms of shipbuilding, you will be surprised to learn, perhaps, that one of the shipyards at Subic, uh, the Hanjin shipyards, has already taken three orders for 20,000 TEU container ships. So post Panama. Post so we have yes. the capability, but again, as a shipbuilding country, we are dependent on designs that are brought in by other countries, by other companies. What it reflects is the fact that the Philippines is a flexible platform. We have the resources. In fact, a lot of the people who are currently working on ships have developed a global skill set that can be brought back into the Philippines, whether you're talking about machinists, fitters, all of the people who have had that kind of technical skill are actually skills of a global nature. They can be brought back into the Philippines, and this is the inclusive growth model that I refer to. Because as opportunities arise on shore, they will want to come back, but it opens up an opportunity for a whole new set of Filipinos to go on board, and we then continue to perpetuate that whole effort. On, on, and on, as an aside, if we have many Filipinos working on cruise ships, they are already exposed to the highest global standards of tourism hotel and restaurant management. They are the immediate resource that can be brought back to the Philippines to support the government's efforts to enhance our tourism capability, which again opens up an opportunity for new Filipinos to go abroad. So in terms of the skill set, so Joe, maybe you might want to take the, the thing of, of a receding uh, shipbuilding sure. capability. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, I, wanted to, I was thinking about checking an egg because I think the Panama Canal actually expanded because the shipyards around the world were building larger vessels right. because of the economies of size. You can move a lot more goods with the same ship, blah, blah, and, and that, that made sense. So they, they built it up. You, you wouldn't be surprised to know that there are ships now that won't be able to go through the expanded Panama Canal. Hence, hence sure. we get people talking about Nicaragua Canal, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Correct. So you see that you see where things can go, but the uh, and and don't get me started about whether or not there are logistics ashore that are going to be capable of handling that amount right. that's going to be coming in. That's right. a whole other story, and and our nation is not currently capable of handling that. Yes. All right. But uh, to to the to the skill set, I think you know these shipyard jobs are really very good jobs. Mm -hmm. They're, they're well paid, and uh, I find that where there's well paid jobs, there's training institutions that begin to, right. to arrive, to begin to train young people. The problem with shipbuilding is that what happens when there isn't a ship being built? You can be very active when the ship is being built, and uh, so certain government mm. supports in certain countries say, well, we're going to build a ship anyway. Well, it isn't like the Field of Dreams. You know, the, if, you have, if you have too many ships and too little cargo, somebody starts to lose a lot of money. Yeah, right. And and currently we're in that process with the with the bulk carriers today. There's a, there's a very serious problem associated with that. Yeah. But but I enjoyed the questions because of the synergy of the yeah, entire industry, sure. and we brought in the education issue, Guido, which I think is the 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 baseline hallmark of what we're trying to do in this industry, and you emulate that within the Philippine society, how do we educate our young people to bring them up to take these opportunities? Well, I mean, I'd like to pick up that point on shipbuilding that was asked. Of course, the economics would depend on whether you will need these vessels, but in so far as the Philippines is concerned, we have actually uh, already, we're moving towards modernizing our naval architecture law. In other words, we will encourage naval architects. We will encourage uh, uh, these people, young age, to be looking early on under our K-12 system, mm -hmm. that they will look at the technical aspect of drafting, you know, right. using the CAD, and then exposing them to the ship repair facilities in Subic, in Cebu, 
So there will be place there in seeing these things. Early on, you'll develop now the imagination of young people right. preparing for that eventuality of being able to be taught how to build ships, how to draw ships, and how to design them. And when it comes to competition, I, I do believe that uh, all the rest of the world want to take over the 30% that the Filipinos <laughs> are, uh, are there. So that's why we have filed a bill to improve our education. Yes, we're going to compete, mm. but it will be very difficult for them to get the genetic genes of the Filipinos that love the sea. <laughs> Maybe Scott. Yes. I think, I, I, think um, uh, I, I, I echo Congressman Manalo, and that's why I feel very confident. But maybe, Mr. Lachica, we can turn that question around because there's something interesting related to technology. The ships that we're talking about today are ships that are going to continue to be built through, say, 2018, 2019, 2020. The designs of those ships are already in place. But let's consider what kind of a ship is going to be out there between 2020 and 2030. What are the technologies that are available? You just have to look at drone airplanes. Mm -hmm. You look at the Google driverless car. Mm -hmm. That kind of technology is beginning to uh, become available. And as bandwidth becomes available, telemetry will take over, and maybe more and more control will be shore side. Now, I know this is an ongoing debate that we've had interesting discussions <laughs> with Joe. But if that does happen, then the number of people on board the ship may not be as many. So while there will be competition from other countries, I think there will be competition from technology. So the kind of maritime professional we need to build in the future has got to be technology oriented. And this is why when we talk of education and training, what better place to come than America where technology is a part and parcel of the whole educational process. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very important for us because we want to be able to build the maritime professional of the future. When you consider that in the Philippines you have to go through four years of college to be able to become an officer candidate and then one year at sea, and then it takes you another 10 years to going from being a cadet to becoming a captain or a chief engineer, you're talking about 14 or 15 years. So what is the ship of 2030 going to be like? Because that's the time when the person who is in school today is going to become the captain, the captain. or the chief engineer. Right. So we have to add that dynamic to the whole discussion. So there are short-term issues that we need to talk about, but there are longer-term issues which involve technology, which involve an understanding of process and the impact it has on people. That's why working hand in hand with our legislators are so important because we need to have the kind of policies that are long term. Our view must not be just for today. It's got to be 2030, 2040, 2050. And when we talk about a global alliance and a global maritime issue, talking about a country like the United States is an important element because the United States will continue to be one of the engines of growth. And being an engine of growth, trade will happen. And if trade happens, then inevitably, all countries who want to participate in that trade will be able to participate. So we've got to go back to the basic fundamentals. And this is where the discussion, the visit, the encouraging visit with the, with the congressional delegation should be just the first step of many other opportunities. And this is where I hope that the US Philippine Society will continue to take <laughs> maritime affairs as an important multiplier uh, industry, because it does have far-reaching effects. And, and, and as well with, with you, Joe. Right. Yeah, part of our discussion, I think, involved uh, the, you know, the maritime limbo contest, right. I call it, which is how low can you go in Manning? Right. <laughs> and uh, we, we can get that. And I think, frankly, we have to take into account the social impact of a very small crew sure. on a ship that's spending two to three to four weeks at sea. Right. And uh, so we aren't going to get down to zero like the drones, though, yes. are we? No, no, I don't think so. Don't no, 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 so. no, no, okay. no, no. <laughs> you got to have at least one person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, listen, uh, one of the best things about working here at CSIS is the, the fascinating range of issues you get to, to work on and the fascinating people that we get to engage here. So we thank you all for coming. Mr. Ambassador, did you have the last word? Or? Uh, just one uh, comment. We'll get you a microphone here just to <clears throat> hard answer. Before I raise the question, I just wanted to uh, make a comment that when I visited three major cruise lines, uh, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian, all three said they have about 61,000 seafarers and hotel employees. All three said that they are very happy with the performance of Filipino seafarers and hotel employees, and they would like to hire more because they're going to be building more ships. Huh? Uh, but the question I have is that going back to the West Philippine Sea, um, since China is, is you know, undertaking these reclamation activities and, and it said that within 
probably the next few months, they're going to complete the, the um, reclamation. They have airstrips, ports, etc. Once China um, deploys military and civilian personnel in these uh, uh, features, the question is, would that not imperil the principles that the U.S. has been advocating, which is the principle of freedom of navigation and unimpeded lawful commerce? Uh, maybe, Mr. Cox, you may want to just give a comment on that. Uh, I'm smiling because, uh, Ambassador, I've, sp I've twice testified before the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee in favor of our accession to the Law of the Sea Convention. And I think all, all, the, all, the, uh, all the comments of, of uh, our government about freedom of navigation and, and the use of the seas is embodied in that convention. And, and I find it ironic that we're referring to the very, uh, the very uh, basic requirements in the Law of the Sea Convention as the basis for our, uh, our allegations about improper uh, activity by another sovereign nation. And I think that a, a good starting point for the United States uh, government would be to accede to the uh, UN Law of the Sea Treaty. Okay. And then we can, uh, when we clean up our own house, we can talk about others and the activities that they are taking. Okay. Well, with that as a jumping off point, let me thank you all for coming this afternoon. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>